now that we did a brief introduction into learning, we're going to talk about one type of learning or one type of conditioning, and that is classical conditioning. This is also sometimes called Pavlovian conditioning or uh, reflexive conditioning. And some of the reasons for these different names is that it is the type of conditioning originally founded by Ivan Pavlov, and it also is the type of conditioning that refers to our involuntary autonomic reflexes. So classical conditioning is the idea that we have lots of what Pavlov called psychic reflexes. These are not um, psychic readers or fortune tellers, but psychic reflexes are something that you don't have to think about, they just happen. They're the autonomic involuntary reflexes in our body. These can include things such as blinking or coughing or sneezing or drooling or sweating or making your hair stand up straight. It could also be things like your heart racing faster or breathing faster, eye dilation. And of course, it could also be things like sexual arousal. So these are often considered involuntary. Some people can do them consciously, like you can consciously blink and close your eyes, but oftentimes they are considered pretty uh, out of our control. And so what happens here in classical conditioning? There's lots of things in our environment that are naturally going to stimulate these psychic reflexes. If you get dust in your eye, you're going to blink. If you see something scary, your heart is going to race. And you don't need to learn or be conditioned to do these things. But classical conditioning is the idea that we can pair and match antecedents or things that become before the psychic reflex. So by matching and pairing these antecedents, we can make other things cause these psychic reflexes that otherwise would not. And so this is the idea that things that naturally wouldn't cause us to blink, we can train ourselves to blink to. So we're gonna dive into it a little bit deeper just by refreshing our memory of Pavlov's discovery. So Ivan Pavlov, once again, he was a Russian medical physiologist. He was not a psychologist, and he was interested in studying the texture and consistency of different types of saliva. And he was studying this in canines. So what we have here in the center of the page is this drawing of his apparatus that he hooked the dogs up to. So they were in a bit of a harness thing, they couldn't run away, and then in their mouth, in the sides of the corners of their mouth, they had an apparatus that would measure and collect the drool and the saliva that they produced. And he found in certain conditions, saliva could be runny and more like water, and saliva could be more sticky and thick when there was something that the dogs were going to digest, like meat in front of them. And when he was trying to test these differences, he found a mistake. And some of our best scientific findings have actually been found through mistakes. And the mistake was the dog began to drool when there was no meat presence, when there was no stimuli for them to put in their mouth. And what he actually found was that the dogs were pairing some antecedents. The, the, the drooling is a psychic reflex, an involuntary reflex, and they were starting to ref do this reflex to things that they otherwise naturally wouldn't. They started to drool to the sounds of his assistant's footsteps walking towards the research lab. They started to drool to the sounds of the research lab door opening, as it usually does before this, the researcher hands them the meat or puts the meat on the, on the apparatus. And so they started to understand what comes before receiving the meat. And even if they didn't have conscious thought about that, remember behaviors are not interested in our conscious thought, the dogs were responding in a way that made it known that somewhere in their neurology, they understood and they had connected the dots and found the correlation between the footsteps and the presence of meat or the door opening and the presence of meat. And so this was really interesting. This is the idea, if you have a dog at home uh, or any other pet at home, they probably have learned to anticipate a lot of your behaviors. As much as you hope you're training your dog, they may be doing a bi-directional effect and training you back. And they may be able to anticipate. Uh, for instance, if you give your dog table scraps at the end of your meal, but not during your meal, they might start to anticipate some of the clues at the end of your meal. Perhaps it's when you finish off your glass of water. Perhaps you push away from the table a little bit more or your conversation ceases, And that's when the dog will become really jumpy knowing they're going to receive table scraps. So what was really interesting here is Pavlov jumped on this mistake, decided to rework things and do another study where instead of necessarily matching the meat to footsteps or a door, but now the meat was going to be matched with the presence of a bell ringing. So as the meat was placed before the dog, a bell would ring. And then after so many times, the meat was not presented, but just the ringing of the bell would cause the drooling. So when we think about the pairing of the meat and the bell, it's important to understand we have specific words that we like to use. We have the terms unconditioned, conditioning, and conditioned to describe these different scenarios. 
So what we have here is originally before the bell is even presented, before any training or conditioning has taken place, if the dog is presented with meat, they will drool. Before any conditioning has taken place, when the dogs are considered unconditioned, if a bell is rung, the dogs will have no response. But if we do conditioning trials, if we pair the bell and the meat together, then the dog will drool, there is meat present. And if we do enough conditioning trials and we pair these two antecedents together enough, then we'll find that the bell will be conditioned and ringing the bell will produce that psychic reflex of drooling. And the dogs are likely very unaware of this, that they're drooling to just these other environmental stimuli. So this is sort of the idea of how we can go about this. Originally, there is something that will produce the reflex, which is the meat. Originally, there is something that will not produce the reflex, the bell. If we pair both those two stimuli, those two antecedents, then eventually we get conditioned and just the one that originally didn't produce the effect will now produce an effect. It's important to understand that it can also be conditioning if the meat and the bell don't produce the exact same effect. It might be possible that the dog is going to drool more and the saliva is going to be a different consistency when the meat is there and a slightly different consistency when it's the bell with no meat. That's still okay. That we're still getting a new effect through the conditioning. And it's okay if the two different stimuli or the two different antecedents get a slightly different response. So if we want to talk about this in more detail, it's important to understand that in terms of classical conditioning, there are very specific types of notation required to describe a classically conditioned paradigm. So we're going to introduce some new types of words and definitions here, but they're ones that you can probably map on pretty easily. In every classical conditioning paradigm, we tend to have what's called an unconditioned stimulus. You'll see this abbreviated in lots of textbooks as either UCS or just US, as unconditioned stimulus. And the unconditioned stimulus is something that can produce a psychic reflex with no conditioning. So in the example of the dog, this is the meat. The meat will produce the drooling with no learning, no conditioning. But let's use another example. Let's imagine the sting of a wasp or a hornet. That sting is going to produce a reflex in our body with no conditioning. When we get that venomous sting, let's say in our elbow area, it's going to produce swelling, it's going to produce pain, it's going to alert our neurological system that there's been an invasion and we are experiencing an injury. So that is an unconditioned stimulus. The sting is unconditioned, much like the meat. We also have an unconditioned response, often abbreviated as UCR or just UR, unconditioned response. And in the example with the dog, that's the dog drooling to meat. You don't need to train it, you don't need to learn that. In the example with the hornet stinging our, our, our elbow, the unconditioned response would be the pain response in our body. And along with the pain response, the pain response might also make our heart speed up, it might make us cry, it might make us go into a fight or flight reflex. And so we don't need to be trained for that, we don't need to experience that multiple times in our life in order to have that. It's the idea that the first time we're stung by a wasp, even if we don't know what a wasp is, our body will have that reflex. Then we have what's known as a neutral stimulus, NS. And this is something that prior to learning, prior to conditioning, it should have no dramatic um, impact on us. It's something that's benign, it's something that's neutral. Now, in, this can be a little bit gray. In some conditions, the neutral could be not exactly neutral. But for the purposes of right now, we're going to say a neutral stimulus is something totally benign, doesn't get much of a reaction out of us. And so this could be the bell in the dogs. Was, wasn't really doing too much before the conditioning, before the learning. It's just something that happened, same as footsteps, didn't really make them go into fight or flight, didn't really make them panic, didn't make them calm down. No reflex there. Now, let's say you grew up not afraid of insects. So it's quite possible that before you ever, and we know this, that infants are not born afraid of insects. So infants would not be scared the first time they see a wasp or a hornet. It's going to be a neutral stimulus. It's hard to imagine that uh, right now in your life, perhaps, because you've been conditioned to be afraid of, of hornets or wasps. But there was a time in your life you felt nothing towards them and they were benign. So before a wasp or a hornet ever stung you or before you've ever learned that they could sting, they would be a neutral stimulus. So it's very possible for someone now when they see a wasp, they don't panic, there's no big psychic reflex going on in their bodies. However, if you get stung by a wasp and you see it very clearly, this is, this is the thing that stung you, uh, this may become a conditioned stimulus.
And this may not require many conditioning matchings. You might not need to pair the sting and the visual of a wasp very much. Even one pairing might be enough for this to become a conditioned stimulus because it's so salient. Sometimes we have to match this multiple times, like match the meat and the bell multiple times over, but sometimes just once is enough. Either way, once that neutral stimulus becomes something that is now evoking a response, it's no longer neutral. It's now considered the conditioned stimulus or the CS. So in the dog example, this is when the bell changes and can get a response. In our wasp example, this is now the wasp. This might be even if you see a wasp in a movie or you see a wasp far away and it can't sting you or behind mesh where it can't get through, uh, it's possible that you are now going to have a response. And now that response is going to be a conditioned response or the CR. In the dog example, this would be drooling to the bell alone, which may not be the exact same drooling pattern as with meat. And in our wasp example, it's very unlikely you're going to feel pain shooting through your elbow. It's not going to be the same, but the conditioned response could be panic or fear. It could be uh, increased heart rate. It could be increased breathing rate. It could be eye dilation. And so you're going to have that. Important thing I want to emphasize here is the unconditioned response that you'd have to the sting of the wasp and the conditioned response you'd have to the visual of the wasp do not need to be identical. And in often cases, they are similar, but slightly different.